Hi, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Turpin, I work with Coveen. In today's meeting, we'll be discussing NextGen 911 and how your organization can begin to plot a path towards compliance. We have an enormous amount of information to cover in just 30 minutes, so please be assured if we don't get to every question, we will follow up with you via email. If you want to ask a question, please post it in the Q&A versus the chat. This will ensure that our panelists see your question and can respond appropriately. Uh, if you have any questions that have come up after the event, please feel free to reach out to us at sales at coveen.com via email. With that, let's begin. Today, we're gonna cover four particular topics. The first one will be the definition of Kerry's Law and Ray Bonds Act. We're gonna marry that up with what your organization needs to be thinking about to establish and maintain compliance with these two new laws. We'll talk about how you can balance risk management with employee safety, especially during these trying times of COVID. Last, we'll discuss what factors influence cost when you're thinking about what your organization will need to take on to be compliant with these new laws. But before we get started with the presentation, I'd like to play a video from Hank Hunt, who is Carrie Hunt Dunn's father. And uh, he really describes in his own words why this is so important in the real world impact of Carrie's law. So let's go ahead and play that video now so that we can discuss what happened and why Carrie's law came to be. In December of 2013, my daughter, Carrie, was murdered by her estranged husband at a hotel. Their oldest daughter, nine years old, called 911 four times, but it didn't work. The hotel had a multi-line telephone system, or MLTS, which required her to dial an extra nine before making a call. We don't teach our children to dial an extra digit or prefix number. We teach them to call 911. The governor of Texas and President Trump have signed Carrie's law into effect. All schools with an MLTS phone system must ensure that direct access to 911 is available. That means you can call 911 without any additional number or prefix from any phone. I can't bring Carrie back, but I can make sure her legacy continues. Carrie's law is not for those who are gone. Carrie's law is for those we can save. I wanna highlight something there in that message from Carrie's father. While he talked specifically about schools and that PSA, Carrie's law applies to all businesses. And there are three components to Carrie's law that we need to consider um, to avoid another tragic incident, like what happened with his daughter and his granddaughter being unable to reach 911. Essentially, the phone system in that hotel room required a prefix. In many of our businesses, uh, we find that there's an eight or a nine or a star, there's some type of an access code in order to reach an outside line. Uh, that has to go away to reach 911. You, you cannot require an outside access code to make a 911 call anymore. The law went into effect February 16th of 2020. So every organization needs to be compliant with this law right now. Beyond just being able to call 911 directly, it states that a notification must be provided to someone within your organization when a 911 call is made. Uh, this is a two-part requirement. Not only do we need the notification, but we also need a, a location of the uh, caller and the callback number. So when we think about when we make a 911 call, uh, that, that call typically goes out, and in a lot of cases, it goes out with the main number of the business, especially if it's coming from a common area phone, like a lobby phone or a break room, where we may not have assigned what's known as a direct inward dial or DID number that can be accessed from the outside. Carrie's law says that's gotta change. So the direct dial access, the notification, and the valid callback number are the three components to remember for Carrie's law. And of course, with it taking effect, many organizations are probably outside of compliance. And that's our goal here today, is to help educate you about these laws and how to be compliant. If there's one thing you take away from today's meeting, it's to go back and meet with your IT team to discuss how you can remediate any outside access codes that may be required in order to directly access a 911 operator. And then 
make the plans for the notification and how you're going to handle the callback numbers. Ultimately, this may be programming that takes place on your phone system, and it may be a very simple fix, or it may require some type of vendor-specific solution or third-party solution in order to achieve that. Either way, Carrie's law is in effect right now and certainly needs attention. Let's talk next about some definitions as we talk about Ray Bonds Act. There are three items that need explanation as it pertains to Ray Bonds. I'm going to talk about the ERL first and the ELIN next. These are industry specific terms. They are not necessarily Ray Bombs terms, but in order to discuss the dispatchable location defined in, in the Ray Bombs Act, we need to talk a little bit about what makes up a dispatchable location. First is the emergency response location. Let's imagine for a moment that you have a 40 story building that your office is in. Perhaps you occupy a few of the floors in that, uh, in that building. Let's pretend for a moment that those floors are open floor plans and you have cubicles spread out. Many of our customers, in order to define these emergency response locations, will carve up that floor into quadrants, perhaps, and will have a northwest quadrant or a southwest quadrant or something along those lines that help first responders understand where to go. And, and that's the idea of an emergency response location is defining within your building where you have different locations. Perhaps it's a break room that you get defined. Um, the, the important part here is that there has to be some type of additional information beyond just the street number. And that's what ties into the dispatchable location component is being able to say more than 123 Main Street. That's just not sufficient anymore. We need to say 123 Main Street, 14th floor, break room, or 123 Main Street, 14th floor, Northwest Quadrant, so, something along those lines. Um, the second part about Ray Bombs ties in with Carrie's Law a little bit here and, um, and how the software works between these different solutions. And that's the emergency location identification number. In order to get a call back into an appropriate, uh, or excuse me, by the, uh, to the caller, to the person who actually made the 911 call, um, we have to have some type of phone number that's accessible from the outside. And that's that DID or the direct inward dial number. So imagine for a moment that your main business phone number is 314-555-1212. It is not sufficient to, to send out a call. We talked about that in Carrie's Law. But what we need, now need to do is we need to marry up an outside access number with that emergency response location. So as we're thinking about that 14th floor break room, it needs to have a number associated with it when a 911 call is made. And there's a lot of complex technology that makes that happen underneath the covers. But at the end of the day, we need to think about these terms, these emergency response locations, the emergency identification number, as we're thinking about how we're going to be compliant with Ray Bombs Act. So now that we've understood some of the definitions, we, we know that we have these quadrants or perhaps these common areas that are named and defined as our emergency response locations, and we know that we have to assign a number. Let's talk about what Ray Bombs specifically requires. It states, that when a 911 call is placed, you must provide a dispatchable location. And recall, it is no longer, it no longer allowed for you to send 123 Main Street. That's not sufficient. You need to say 123 Main Street, 14th floor, break room. That law takes effect January 6th of 2021. And so if you are not already making plans to become compliant with Ray Bombs Act, we need to start beginning that implementation planning now with your organization, because if you're a larger organization, this is going to be a lot of work. We need to do a complete inventory and create a mapping of where your floor plans and where your employees and where your phones are laid out to locations that can be reported to the first responders. Very likely, this is going to require some type of integration with the next gen 911 provider. 
and you're going to need some third-party software to do this. The fact of the matter is very few phone systems, if any, support full compliance with Ray Bombs Act and Carries Law. So you will need something in order to achieve compliance. But Ray Bombs Act goes further. It doesn't just end with the phones within the four walls of your building. Ray Bombs Act has a second component that I want to discuss, and that's the remote workforce. So as we're thinking about folks that are you know, working from home now due to COVID and how that has just changed everything about how we work and how we communicate, we need to keep an important date on our radar, and that's January 6th of 2022. Ray Bombs is going to state that you have to provide a dispatchable location for the remote worker now. So if you have a remote worker at home and they're using a soft phone on their computer, or you've given them a phone to take home that's tied into your business phone system, and they call 911, it is not allowed for you to send those emergency responders to your headquarters. You need to provide the home address of that employee. And not only that, you need to start thinking about how are we gonna capture that information? What are the business workflows we're gonna use so that we can actually keep that information up to date. You know, 2022 seems like it's a far way away, but it will be here before we know it. And the planning really should begin now as we think about how we're gonna solve for compliance. So let's break this down. We've got our components here of Carey's Law and Ray Bombs Act in five simple steps. Starting from the most important and the most dire, you know, things that we need to do right this very moment. And that is, when we say 911, we mean 911. So after this event, I hope that you take this back to your IT team and you make plans to remove any outside access code that your phone system might be requiring in order to access a 911 operator. Next, we need to ensure that when a call goes out to 911, we're sending it to the correct location with a number that can be called back by that operator in case of a disconnect. What do we mean by the correct PSAP or the public safety answering point? Well, in a lot of businesses, especially businesses with multiple locations, you may be sending calls out as your main number, even when you're calling from different cities. Imagine for just a moment that you have an office in Chicago and an office in Detroit. If Chicago is the headquarters and your Detroit employees are calling 911, but the number that shows up is your Chicago headquarters phone number, you could be sent to the wrong 911 operator, the wrong public safety answering point. That's a very bad situation. We've delayed the response now significantly because we're talking to the wrong 911 operator. So we have to remediate that and ensure that we're contacting the right PSAP by using the correct callback number associated with that location. The third thing that we need to talk about with our employees and with our IT team is understanding who's going to be contacted and receive that notification that a 911 call has been placed and identifying those emergency response locations within our organization so that we know where the call is coming from and we can respond to it appropriately. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that on the next slide too. Last, as we're thinking about that January 2021 date, as well as 2022, we need to begin making plans about how we will dynamically track phone locations within our organization and ensure that when a 911 call is made, we're reporting the correct location. Let's think about that a little bit more. In our scenario of the 40-story building and the 14th floor break room, what happens if someone picks up that phone and moves it to a lobby? on the 17th floor. Maybe we don't need that phone in the break room anymore. Now we pick it up, we move it, we put it in the lobby where we need it. How are we going to update that information to ensure that our phone system is sending out the correct information? The answer is we're very likely going to need a third party to achieve that, to keep track of when that phone moves and where it's at inside the organization and keep track of that mapping. And then last, we have to start thinking about how we'll achieve compliance in 2022. The sooner we start that planning, the better. As we think about the next components between risk management and safety, this is very much a balancing act, especially because of COVID. 
first I want to call out what Carrie's law actually came from. And that was the lawsuit that started and the family's efforts to get this law passed to ensure that this wouldn't happen again. And there, there was certainly some successful litigation about this. Uh, the family was uh, enabled to sue not only the husband who committed the act and, and killed Carrie Dunn, but also they sued the hotel um, for not being able to call 911 directly, as well as not training the staff on how to respond to an emergency. So nowhere in Carrie's law does it say that we have to provide some type of training for the staff. But in this particular case, the family was successful in saying that the hotel operator had a responsibility and failed to train their staff to appropriately respond when a 911 call was made. So now as we're thinking about that training that might be required, that ties into the notification. Well, what kind of notification might we want to respond to versus flee from? Simple example would be the active shooter. That is a, a very likely scenario where you do not want to send folks rushing to the scene of that 911 call or to the source of that 911 call. But a heart attack, on the other hand, might make perfect sense, especially if we have a defibrillator in the building. We have folks that have been trained on how to use it and we could send them to perhaps improve the outcome of that person who is experiencing the heart attack. You know, a lot of our customers are talking to us about conferencing in their designated response team, such as a security team or folks that have had first aid or CPR training so that they can listen to the 911 call, evaluate the response and determine how they want to triage that situation. Last, as or last two really play very close uh, pairs with each other, and that is the, the way that you're building this situated and laid out the size of the building, the size of your facilities. You know, if we have a 1,500 square foot retail facility where it's one big open uh, you know, room, it's a pretty significant difference compared to perhaps a 15,000 square foot facility. Um, how are we going to identify locations in that 15,000 square feet? or perhaps it's a 150,000 square foot warehouse, right? Those scenarios are very different. And we have to think about uh, you know, that, that definition of an emergency response location, as well as what type of resources do we have inside the building to help guide first responders towards the source of that call. If we have a guard or if we have a receptionist that knows where the 14th floor break room is, they're going to be able to help guide them much more quickly to where they need to go. If we don't, we need to be thinking about signage and perhaps communication. If we have a very large facility, communication with our first responders that are local to that facility to ensure that they're trained on how our building is laid out and that they have information about our facility. Last is we're thinking about the impact of COVID. You know, we're probably in, in many cases wondering, do I really need to be compliant with this law right now? Because nobody's in the office. Perhaps you don't have any, anybody back to work yet. But we need to think about our security teams, our cleaning staff. You know, a lot of these folks are working late in the evening, sometimes all by themselves. And if the building is really truly empty, what does that do to our risk? There is a significant difference between a cleaning person who's in the facility or a security team who's in the facility and there's other folks around versus someone who's in an entire building all by themselves. There are situations and countless stories of folks being all by themselves trying to call 911 and unfortunately not being able to be reached because they couldn't communicate where they were. In a little bit of time that we have left, I want to leave you with some food for thought regarding the cost influencers. First and foremost, what can your phone platform do today? Um, most of the phone platforms are capable of providing the 911 call direct to the 911 operator. Um, may require some reprogramming, but most of them can. Beyond that, when we start to think about notifications, the callback number, dispatchable locations, many of the phone systems that are out there are going to require some type of additional programming or additional software. Uh, even if you're on a cloud phone system, 
you could still need to be looking at some additional subscriptions in order to be compliant with this law. Now, the next thing that plays a role in this is the number of emergency locations. Again, if I have one 1,500 square foot retail facility, I'm going to have a very different number of emergency locations compared to someone with 100 offices that are 15,000 square feet each. And that's gonna drive cost. Not by a lot, but it's gonna drive cost. The thing that really drives it is that inventory process that we discuss next. Do you know where all the phones are at? Do you know where uh, the cables are going from your network switches and your phone system to the actual phones themselves? And if you don't know, if you don't have all that documented, who's going to do that work? Is that going to be somebody from your team? Will it be somebody from Coveen? Will it be a joint effort? That location discovery process, especially for large organizations, needs to begin soon because Ray Bombs kicks in January 6th of 2021 and we're going to need to be compliant and have that information loaded into the system. The next two items as we're thinking about the future here as we get past you know, some of the onboarding and implementation, it'll be the actual go live. Who's gonna support the integration with your phone system and the integration you know, with the, the phone network to provide this dispatchable location information and the dynamic tracking of phones? Who's gonna do the testing? Do you have those skill sets in-house today to perform those activities, or is that going to need to be something that's outsourced? And then last is the remote workers starting to put those plans into motion. How many do you have? How many will you allow to have phones that are tied into the corporate phone system? Uh, perhaps this might be an opportunity to move towards business cell phones, uh, which will already provide great location information as we continue to upgrade these PSAP networks. So a lot of things can impact the costing here. And of course, there's no one size fits all to the pricing. So as we close, I would like to leave you with the four items that Coveen helps our customers with to solve for compliance. One is tackling that assessment of your platform. What can your phone system do? What will we need additional software to achieve? What will we need an additional service to achieve? The inventorying process to understand where your uh, folks are actually laid out inside your building, how we can carve up the floors to make it easy for those first responders to identify and respond to an incident. Then we also help with the selection, implementation, and testing of a solution, uh, whether it's the service or it's the software or all of the above we're gonna help you navigate all of those waters. And then last, as we think about how we're going to keep up with all the software and all these services, we provide managed services for customers, specifically around NextGen 911 software and solutions so that we can help you maintain that compliance for the long term. I did have one question that came in regarding costing that I wanna discuss, and it's very difficult for us to share with you uh, a specific price on the implementation and the software and services. But I do want to point out that when we look at the implementation cost and the overall service, uh, minimal will be in the low thousands. And then the prices really do go up from there depending on the size of your organization. Uh, it's certainly not astronomical, but it does require uh, quite a bit of planning to help scope out exactly what those costs would be. We are just a minute and two minutes over, so I am going to go ahead and wrap up our session here. I do appreciate everyone for joining today. We had an excellent attendance. I look forward to speaking with you at our next event. Thank you.